Today I'm excited because Amanda and I are going to share our testimony with you. And so uh, you'll see some pictures of our childhood and all that good stuff on the screen. Uh, we're going to have a vote as to who was cuter as a child just on the way out. So make sure you vote for her, please. <clears throat> but Daniel chapter 4, verse 2 through 3 says this. It says, It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are His signs, how mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. So when we tell our testimony, we are telling that God is at work in our generation. Amen? That God is at work from generation to generation. And if you sit in this place today and you say, can God use me in my generation? The answer is yes. Also, the, the scripture tells us in Revelation chapter 19 that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when we begin to testify about what Jesus has done, it's also something that he might be prophesying over you. That is, when we tell our story of transformation, the Holy Spirit is saying, I can do it for you as well. And so I want to encourage you to have an expectation in your heart this morning. As you hear about how God has moved in our lives, where he took Amanda and I from our brokenness and brought us to a place of not only salvation, but being called to ministry and then being entrusted with the position of being able to serve as your senior pastor. God is good. And he... He, he is mighty to save. If that, was the, if that was the theme that I wanted to share this morning, it would be God is mighty to save. And so we're going to uh, start off by letting Pastor Amanda share, and then, uh, yeah, and then I'll jump in. Hallelujah. She figured out that I put you up to this. Well, so. earlier I said, well, I guess the older will go first. So I am a couple years older than Kyle. Um, so we'll let the wiser know. He's definitely wiser now. Um, but uh, as he's talking about generation, generation, one thought I, I had was I'm here today because of prayer. And I believe that when my mother was adopted, I've heard this story you know, just a couple times, but when she was adopted and she was able to meet her birth grandfather uh, at one time, he told her, uh, Susan, I've been praying over you from the moment I saw you in the nursery. And my mom was adopted into a non-Christian home, but has had the fire of God since she was four years old. And so I believe that I stand here today because of those prayers of the generations that um, came before me. I've also had to fight a lot of the generations that came before me. Can anyone say <laughs> amen? <laughs> Um, so I've, I've learned a lot, but for me, I grew up in California, Southern California. I grew up with, uh, three sisters and my parents, uh, together. That's, yeah, I know. Right. If any of you guys know Lyndon, right, that's not him. <laughs> Those are me and my sisters and the baby there is actually my younger sister. Um, yeah, I know. I'm. Trust me, I'm a lot cuter than Kyle is. So. <laughs> no. Um, but I had a really great childhood. Really, really great childhood. Looking back, um, I grew up as a child really, uh, really believing that we were kind of the family that made other families jealous. You know what I mean? I don't mean that to speak that, but we had everything going for us. We had two parents. We had four beautiful girls. We had this perfect picture family, right? We still are per perfect picture, picture perfect, whatever you call them. I think of Michael W. Smith. Anybody falling back to, yeah? Okay, I got a couple of head nods. <laughs> Um, I grew up on all that. I grew up going to Carmen concerts and Michael W. Smith and Amy Grant and going to church Sundays and Wednesdays. And it's just, we did the church thing. We checked off the box. We went. We would have family suppers, you know, every Sunday at my grandparents' house. And I will tell you, living in the South, nobody can touch my grandmother's fried chicken. So, right now. truly. Uh, so, that's a competition right there. <laughs> uh, 
No, we really did. We had it great. We had wonderful uh, holidays. Um, when I look back on my, my life, my good times were really when my family was together. Me and my sisters were uh, kind of like the four musketeers in a way. <laughs> you know, we, we grew up because when we were left home, we would play together. You know, we just always, always were around each other. And uh, it was really, really, it was something. Like, I wish, I wish today that I still had what I had then because I don't. And God's given it to me in different ways. But uh, my parents actually had some hard times come on them. They had a lot of things that they had to deal with with me and my sisters. Um, one of my sisters had brain surgery. My youngest one, the baby, had uh, brain surgery when she was seven years old. So my parents went through a lot of uh, difficulties just having to fight battles on their own um, in their testimony in their time of what they can tell. Um, I also went through a testing in my time of the doctors telling my parents, well, I think it's one of five things, and every one of those things was ending in death. And it wasn't. It was mono. So <laughs> if you're a doctor, please don't do that to a parent. <laughs> But it was a trying time because, like, when I talked to my dad about that today, he's like, that was one of the most difficult times in my life. Mm. And then finding out you had mono was like, why would someone do that to us? Uh, but honestly, I was, they had their struggles. That's not my testimony. Theirs is not mine. Mine is that they started having some difficulties in their marriage. And so when I was probably in middle school, um, my dad, they would kind of separate. My dad would go live with his grandparents, or his parents, my grandparents. And so we would kind of be pushed back and forth. I don't really remember a lot back then. But I do remember that ultimately they did divorce. And they split up in my freshman year of high school. And if any of you guys remember high school, having something that traumatic happening your freshman year, um, it was not fun. So I started to grow a lot of anger and bitterness inside of me. Um, I, I absolutely, I can say this now because I don't, I don't think this now, is that I really hated my mom. I really wanted nothing to do with my mom. My mom and I have a relationship today. We get along. We, I actually have a relationship as an adult that I never had as a child. So I'm very grateful that God has um, redeemed some of that for me. So it's... It's just kind of, it's amazing to kind of look back on your life and see this movie play out and see where God is in it all, right? Like yeah. he was always there. So as a freshman, I started to just kind of feed off of that anger and bitterness and just stop caring about what my parents think. Or I was a daddy's girl, so I was always with my dad. Mm -hmm. I never went out on the weekends unless it was with my dad to the batting cages or bowling or you know, blockbuster to get a movie or something like that. That's the good times that I had. I didn't party until, um, until my parents split. And so there was a lot of, uh, you know, just this tornado starting to happen in my life and starting to pick up and I was ready to go along with it and start dabbling. And, you know, I started smoking cigarettes. I started to, um, have my first, uh, taste of alcohol um, I started to hang out with people who put me in an environment like that, and it was it was actually better than my home life because my parents weren't together. And I was accepted over here, and I would spend way more time at my friend's house than I would at my own. Uh, and so it, that kind of just grew. And so this tornado kind of grew. Um, it's kind of amazing, though, because Kyle will let you know his side, and I'm really thankful that God protected me from a spiral that could have been worse than it was. And uh, my sophomore year, my mom and my dad both remarried very quickly after they uh, divorced. And so my sophomore year, I decided to move to Tennessee where my mom was uh, to be there with my sister. And I just kind of felt numb. My life was just numb. I was living in a home where I really didn't like living under the roof of my mom and my stepdad in this new marriage that I just could not get on board with because of me still kind of holding on to my own parents. And now I'm forced into this lifestyle of 
oh, man, I have to be nice to someone I don't want to be nice to, which I wasn't nice to him, so don't let me <laughs> fool you. I was not nice to him. Um, but God, again, redeemed that later. And I can tell you right now that when it comes to Kyle and I, my mom and my stepdad were the number one mentors in our life during that time. And so God, again, redeems, and he redeems with people you don't always agree with, right? Amen? Yeah. So um, in Tennessee, I, I graduated from Tennessee uh, in uh, Franklin, and I graduated from high school there. Um, I My last year of high school, I actually was not living at home. It was so bad. My mom and I didn't get along at all. Um, I... <laughs> I was smoking then, and so in order for me to get back at my mom, I never did it around my family. But one time, I decided to pull them out and start lighting up right in front of her to show her who's boss, right? <laughs> As my friends come over and they're taking my stuff out of the house, it really wasn't good. It's funny now, but um, <laughs> I was really an angry, bitter person. Like, if that is just even a little bit of what I could share. Um, so... So I graduated. I graduated barely. Uh, I actually had to talk my economics teacher into passing me from one class so that I could go to summer school for the other two classes I failed. And um, I was also pushed out to uh, pay for that on my own. So I did. And I graduated. And I graduated out of the fear of having to tell my own dad, who didn't live in the, in the state, or my own grandparents who were planning to fly in for my graduation, uh, that, hey, I may not graduate, and I could not face that. I couldn't. And uh, thank God that I worked to really follow through with graduate. I couldn't imagine not having my diploma after that uh, and how hard it would have been to get my GED or anything after that, and I knew that wasn't the route I wanted to go. So I pushed, and I did that, and in summer school, um, I met a guy uh, through a friend of mine, and that's kind of where I'm going to end here. Uh, the guy changed all my dreams uh, that I had, and so I'm going to let Kyle pick up and let, let him tell you a little bit about his childhood. It wasn't this guy, by the way. <laughs> it was a different guy. <laughs> So, do I have a childhood picture? That's a nice graduation photo, by the way. I'm the one in the middle. That's my older brother, Blake, and my younger brother, Clint, who sent me a picture last night. He met my favorite childhood football player last night because he serves at a restaurant called Shula's, which is a pretty high-end restaurant. And uh, Brett Favre showed up in his restaurant last night. Yeah, my little brother got a picture with Brett Favre. That was my that was my hero growing up when they went to the uh, went to the Super Bowl and got beat by John Elway. Anyways, that's me. Uh, I was born in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, very good childhood, actually. Um, kind of like Amanda's. Uh, I'm not sure if we went to church as much as Amanda's family did, but we were a Christian family. Uh, we grew up in the South, and so. Uh, you know, 80% of people go to Southern Baptist churches in the South, uh, and those vary in their, you know, their theology and that kind of stuff. So I didn't really know anything, uh, you know, too deep about the Christian faith other than, you know, ask Jesus into your heart. That was pretty much my understanding of Christianity as a kid. Uh, not that my parents did not seek to raise me as a Christian. They did. Um, but my, my father worked a lot. He was in the restaurant industry, uh, and he did things like rallies. He, he ran a chain of rallies, um, uh, hamburgers, restaurants. He, he ended up uh, running a Papa John's pizza uh, franchise uh, and so forth. Anybody like Papa John's? That's some pretty good pizza. I, I like it. But even after eating like 100,000 slices of it, I still like it. So um, that's, a, that's a different kind of occupation for your dad to have, especially when <clears throat> he, you know, that industry requires you to work at night. So like I'm in school in day, at, uh, I'm in school in the daytime, I come home, my dad's gone to work, you know, he comes home, I'm gone to school. So, so there was that dynamic in my family growing up. Uh, but overall, the childhood part was pretty good. Uh, we moved around a lot too. My dad would get different, 
different jobs. So we moved from Tallahassee to Columbia, South Carolina, back to Tallahassee, from Tallahassee to Birmingham, Alabama, back to Tallahassee, then to Columbus, Georgia, then to Gainesville, Florida. I mean, we moved all over the place. So I had to learn how to make friends quickly, and oftentimes I would make the wrong kind of friends, if you know what I'm saying. <clears throat> Plus, I was the middle child. So all that stuff was happening, and I was getting into quite a bit of trouble. Um, they tried to put me on medicine to cure me. It didn't cure me. Probably made me worse. Um, didn't cure me. Um, but during my teenage years, a lot like Amanda, except my parents ended, ended up not getting divorced, they did go through a lot of difficulties in their marriage. That caused me to kind of isolate myself from my intermediate family. I ended up meeting a girl, and, uh, and we dated in my later teenage years. At the same time, uh, I was making rap beats uh, for, two, for a local la uh, rap group in Columbus, Georgia, where we were living at the time. Uh, that was my thing growing up in high school. I learned how to make rap beats. Uh, that was, we listened to Lil John and the East Side Boys, Ludacris. Do we got any folks in here? I mean, do you all know what I'm talking about? I'm just telling you. I'm not promoting them. That's just what I grew up on in the South. And so I learned how to make beats. I ended up getting this rap group on the radio. We were going to do like small scale concerts and stuff. And so that environment actually has a lot of negative things, if you know what I'm talking about, to, to put it lightly. So I was being, I was isolating from my family. I had a girlfriend. We were having sex out of marriage. I was, I was spending time with uh, all the wrong crowd. And then when I was 17, my dad told me he got a job in Gainesville, Florida. And we were moving again. I was getting ready to go into my senior year of high school. So I was like, here we go again, you know. So I, I tell my girlfriend, I'm trying to hold that relationship together. Hey, I'm going to go to Florida. I'll graduate high school. We'll come back up. We'll get engaged. It'll all be good. That was the idea. So I decided to go. Oh, that's my grandmother, by the way. So uh, I decided to um, go and buy her a gift because we were getting, it was getting close to the time that we were going to leave for Florida. And uh, I found her in the bed with another guy. Yeah, I, I know. My story is quite dramatic. And uh, I owned a gun at the time because being around rap industry, you end up with a gun. And, uh, and so I was going to take the guy out. I was going to take the guy out. Uh, so I went out to my car to get the gun. And... You got everybody in here is like, what? <laughs> I didn't share with this 9 o'clock. I didn't want anybody to have a heart attack at 9 o'clock. So. <laughs> I go out there. I'm about to get the gun. I'm about to go back inside and take care of business. And I hear this voice that says, if you do this, you will go to jail for the rest of your life. I said, well, that must be someone who knows the future of, you know. <laughs> And so I decided not to. Uh, so I end up in Gainesville, Florida, my senior year of high school, home of the Gators, which I'm not a Gator fan either, so it's like the worst place to live your high school year. You got Gator fans all around you. I'm a Seminole fan. Amen? Any amens in the room? Anyways. I'm angry, I'm bitter, and I'm going to pass it back to Amanda at this point. Part. We're in the north. Like nobody cares about the Gators and Seminole. Come on now. <laughs> Come on, we got to get some Seminole fans up in here. Hallelujah. Oh no. Wow. So, so after high school, met a guy, um, and it was really good. Great guy. Still probably to this day, really great guy. Um, and uh, we were serious. We were together for like three years. And the last six months of us being together, we were actually living together at the time. Um, and I mean, think about the whole, just the bitterness and the anger and I, you know, I, I said this before, like, I don't know how he even put up with me then. And I don't know how he puts up with me now. <laughs> he definitely got the better version of me. <laughs> um, but I still have my faults and I still lean back on a lot about a lot of that sometimes. Right. I see a lot of heads nodding like, oh yeah, <laughs> like, if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, um, we were, we were living together and, 
I just, towards the end of it, I just remember uh, just laying down one night and just realizing and crying out to God, like, God, get me out of here. There was nothing wrong. I thought I was going to marry this guy. I just knew that I was not living the way God called me to live. And so there was something inside of me, and I just crying out to him, God, get me out of here. I'm not doing it myself. So if you don't do it, this is the life that I'm going to have. And two weeks later, he comes to me, and he's crying, and he's just devastated. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? It was really serious. And he says, I got I to gotta move back home. I'm like, there's, you know, abandonment, I guess, is a really good word for today, by the way. Praise God for yeah. that. Because it was like being abandoned right there. Mm. Not remembering my prayer two weeks prior, I, uh, I said, well, you go home, we're done. I'm not going back. I'm not going anywhere. Like, I'm, we're either moving forward or we're done. And he said, I got to go home. I said, good, that's fine, go. So we split up. Uh, we separated for good, never went back. Uh, but probably a month later, I think, uh, I had a one-night stand with a friend who was in a close circle uh, with me, just randomly, too much to drink, um, with protection, and ended up with my amazing miracle firstborn Wallace. Uh, so God, again, redemptive stories constantly through my life. Uh, so that was very interesting. Uh, Wallace's dad has never uh, been in the picture. Welcome to be, but has just never been in the picture. And um, I'm going to go ahead and jump a little further to when Kylie and I got married, that God even redeemed that to um, when we got married about two years after, probably almost close to the day, but uh Kyle was able to adopt uh, Wallace. Mm. Yeah. Look at that hair. I know. He's so cute. <laughs> he's so cute. He was the cutest little kid ever. He was. He's so stinky. He was a little afro going everywhere. And, <laughs> oh, he's just so lively. Um, anyways, y'all know what it's like to just focus on your children for a moment, right? So... Um, so God redeems constantly in my life, and um, uh, so Wallace's dad, I was, I was actually, uh, I was actually a couple months pregnant, and I was still serving in church. You know, I still did the whole, well, this is what I'm supposed to do if I'm a Christian kind of lifestyle, but I was living a different lifestyle when I would go home. And um, I met with the youth pastor and the senior pastor of the uh, high school and middle school. And we just sat there, and the youth pastor asked me, he said, so Amanda, have you asked for forgiveness? <laughs> I was like, this is not the question I thought you were going to ask me. Like, get out, don't come back, is kind of what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him, and I'm like, be honest, Amanda. And I looked at him, and I said, no, I haven't. And he said, you need to go home and ask God for forgiveness. So I did. I knew, like, inside of me that that wasn't just him telling me the church thing. It was something inside of me that knew that I had to repent of what happened. And I did, and I went home, and I opened up my Bible, and a small little apartment that I had was, like, the one time that I lived on my own and uh, was doing kind of good. That's a whole other story, but I was just crying out to God. Second time I remember in my life just crying out to him and saying, God, I'm so sorry. God, take this away. Please forgive me for being with this guy. Please forgive me for being with this guy. Please forgive me for smoking, period, but smoking even while pregnant. <laughs> I was a mess. I was a mess. And in that moment of surrendering all that to God, it was like he just broke it all off of me right then and there. No yeah. condemnation. Hallelujah. I remember being pregnant and working, and I'd be on my smoke breaks, pregnant and working, and just thinking, man, shouldn't I feel bad? Like, 
you're all like, yeah, you should have felt bad, right? I didn't because I knew that I walked in this fullness that God was now um, bringing in my life. And um, one, so one of the, I, I shared this a couple Wednesdays ago was that one of the things that God did was he used this girl that I was working with and I was supposed to be going to church that night and I left and I was like, hey, see you later, you know, have a good night. And she's like, oh, cool, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to church. And she's like, oh, you go to church? Right? Oh. <laughs> So God used a lot of that in my life to really show me that it wasn't about just checking off the church card and, you know, doing it, doing church how I was raised, which was you just go, you, you know, you do your few praise and worship, you listen to the message, you go to grandma's house for, for dinner, and then you move on with your life. And um, we didn't have anything in our home that really made me realize that that wasn't what church was really all about. And um, so, um, I don't know, I, I know there's a lot more to this part if you want to talk, and then I'll pick back, back up, up after that. Am I up? Yeah, I'm on. Okay. So, we left off with me in Gainesville after a devastating uh, scenario with uh, my, what I thought was going to be my fiance. And uh, uh, so, already kind of in the drug and alcohol crime mentality, uh, and so that continued to grow in my life. I began to use more drugs. I began to uh, put myself around more people that were also in the same place, uh, and I began to run out of money. And uh, one way that you can support your habit when you use that much drugs is you can sell drugs. So that's what I did. Some people might say, are you embarrassed to admit that? A little bit, but God saved me from it, so I'm not going to hide it. Amen? God saved me from my sin. He saved me from my folly, from my foolishness, from myself. And so that began to spiral out of control. Being that I lived in Columbus, Georgia for some time, I had friends from the rap world that I was in that could get it for cheaper. So I decided I was going to traffic drugs from Georgia to Florida, which is really stupid, by the way. So I'm up there to take care of business, and these lovely things called canine units exist. <laughs> Gotta love some canine units. Any recovering addicts in the room want to say amen to this, some canine units? Amen. <laughs> Those dogs can smell, I'll tell you that much. So what a coincidence. I'm pulled over. I'm thrown into jail for possession of drugs and paraphernalia and a potential trafficking charge, which is a felony that sends you away for a while. So I decided to return to my Christian roots in that jail cell, whatever they were. I didn't know what Southern Baptist was. I didn't know what Pentecostal was. I didn't know what anything was. I just knew Jesus might be able to help me out in this situation. They tell me he's a pretty nice guy. So I say, Lord, help me. I, I say, God, please get me out of this. I'm in, a, I'm in a state that's not my state. I'm not around my family. I'm about to go to jail for a long time. Help! And he responded and he said, I'm going to help you this time, but if you don't stop, I'm not going to help you next time. I was like, whoa. I said, Lord, I want to follow you, but you need to show me how. And that's where things began to change. And they did not move forward with a trafficking charge. They actually reduced it to a misdemeanor charge that I was able to do probation for. I was able to be released. I went back to Florida. Yeah, it was miraculous. Just the favor of God, him speaking to me and telling me that he would get me out of it. And he did. So I moved back to Gainesville, Florida, and I realized that the people I was around, I wasn't going to be able to heed to God's warning in Gainesville. So I decided I was going to call my uncle, who was in Tallahassee, to give me a job because he owned a restaurant, and my grandmother, who you saw me in my graduation picture, 
uh, called her to ask if she would give me a place to stay because she also lived in Tallahassee. They both said yes. So I moved to Tallahassee to get a f- fresh start. But if anybody's been where I've been, you know that wherever you go, there you are. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And if you don't get this right on the inside, you're not going to see this go right on the outside. So it isn't long after I arrive in Tallahassee that old friends start showing up from high school and from other places. It's funny how the devil knows how to orchestrate some stuff. So I went twice as hard with what I was doing. I got into really bad scenarios, so much so that there was a snitch that they wanted me to help them take care of, a long story short. A snitch is an informant to the police, by the way, for those who don't know. And informants to the police can hurt the business. So you have to get rid of informants to the police. So it made me start to think about what did I, what I had become. And was I really willing to take this step that you can't undo? And so I was reminded of God's words in that jail cell. I was reminded, if you don't stop, I won't get you out next time. So the same God that told me, if you do this, you're going to jail for the rest of your life. And I said, okay, I won't do it. The same God that said in the jail cell, I'll get you out now, but not if you don't stop. The same God that I said, I want to follow you, but you got to show me how. His presence begins to invade my life, and I say, wow, this is what you were warning me about. I repent. And I threw away my, I took my drugs, I took my money, I took my throwaway phone, and I did what you do with a throwaway phone, and I threw it away. And I took the drugs and and the money, and I went to my, my overlord, I don't know what you want to call the guy. And I said, here you go, I'm done. He wasn't very happy. And I, by the grace of God, escaped. Um, God saved me out of that. He pulled me out of the miry clay and he put my feet upon a rock. And uh, so I began to serve in that restaurant that my uncle owns. And uh, a guy named Kyle Kemp showed up and... He was an old friend of mine, and he and I used to get into some trouble together, but I found out that he was going into Bible college. And he invited me to a church called Lifeway Community Church, a spirit-filled Pentecostal church that was pastored by a man named Eli Hendricks, if anybody remembers that name. And Eli Hendricks flowed in the power of the Holy Spirit, and I had never seen that or experienced that before, and my life was transformed. And Pastor Eli began to see the call of God that was on my life that I could not even see. Anybody hearing me this morning? Sometimes you need to say something to somebody who's not seeing something they need to be seeing. Amen? And he began to take me out to lunch every week. He began to disciple me. And he began to pour the word of God into me. And he began to bring that gift of God that was inside me alive. And so I was faced with wanting to go to college. This was back in 2008. And I was wanting to go to college. Or no, this was in late 2007. And so I began to pray, and I began to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I, I want to be a history teacher, but I feel like you're telling me no on that. What do you want me to do? And he, the same God that spoke to me in the jail cell said, you're called into ministry. Okay, if I'm called into ministry, I need to go to Bible college then. So you're going to have to provide for me to go to Bible college. I went and began to visit the Bible colleges and I wasn't getting any results. And when I walked into this spirit-filled Pentecostal Bible college called Covenant Bible College and Seminary, the dean of the college said that the Holy Spirit uh, told him to give me a full scholarship all the way up to my doctorate. And I began to go to college. Hallelujah. I began to pastor as a youth pastor while I was in college. And I began to uh, teach in that college, and then I planted a Bible college in South Florida after some years. And that's where we were for about eight years before we moved here. I was the associate pastor of a church called Freedom Church, and I was the president of a college called New Covenant Bible College. So I'm going to stop there and let Amanda fill in the rest. Yeah, I love our story. I love our story because God was working on us. 
probably, I believe, at the same time, same years, same time, same season, whatever you want to call it. You know, Kyle's getting back into church and has this, you know, is starting to go to college was the same time that I got pregnant with Wallace and was going through the time of just truly surrendering my life and coming into this relationship with God. And he just continued to do that. I think really our, our stories align, you know, for people who aren't the same age, our stories, God made them align just as they should be. And uh, so I got pregnant and it was the greatest thing because it really pushed me to get into this relationship with God. Uh, I started, instead of spending my off days, which were, you know, back to back, I had really weird schedules, but I spent my off days with um, my mom and my stepdad instead of spending them at the bar. Now, obviously, I'm pregnant. I'm not going to go to the bar. Like, okay, I was smoking, but I wasn't drinking too, okay? But <laughs> uh, but I went, and I, would, I just remember being pregnant and just praying, like, God, separate my sin from my child. This isn't his choice. Um, these cigarettes were not his choice. Separate that. And I'm believing that you're going to take that from me. Um, so he did. He miraculously uh, took that from me. Uh, I, I had my last cigarette the night before he was born. I went in and had him and uh, came home to the home of my mom and my stepdad. And I knew that if I were to continue to smoke, just as I did back in high school, it was going to cause a lot of frustration and division and fighting. And why are you doing this? You shouldn't. I was like, I do not want to hear my mom say one more word about me smoking. So on our way home, we stopped by to get um, the uh, medicine that I, that I needed because I had C-sections for all my kids, so I had to have pain meds. And I remember she was going in to get them. I could, you know, barely move or walk or twist or anything, and I just took my cigarettes out of the um, compartment of my car and threw them and my lighter and everything away so that in the six weeks of being quarantined with my parents over healing from having a baby, I would never be tempted to go to my car mm. to go grab them. And since the day Wallace has been born, I have not picked up a cigarette since. That is a true miracle. Yes. And, and being married to me, that's... Being married I've to wanted me. to That's pick a up a cigarette many right times. There, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> um, yeah, totally <laughs> tempted. I enjoyed it. I, I still, there's moments where I'm like, oh, I could just get away from my family for just a second and just kind of step away from life. And it sounds really, it sounds good as I'm saying this to you right now, too. And I'm reminded of, but who were you before and who are you now? Right. And what has God done in my life since then? And I can tell you that living without that, I will never pick up another one because I know who God is now in my life, as opposed to um, the checkbox that I was checking off before. So um, shortly after, at the same time I was going through um, uh, getting pregnant, my parents, my mom and my stepdad were actually going through a very traumatic time in their life as well. And so God really used them to uh, really pour into my life and help teach me what the word was. I mean, one of the first things I remember sitting down with them in the family room and uh, was talking about like Moses's tabernacle. And we lived off of like God TV. And I mean, it was on all the time and we would just sit and talk and uh, then we moved to Tallahassee because a job opportunity was happening. So Wallace was about six weeks old or so, nine weeks old when we moved to Tallahassee. Uh, we started going to the same church that Kyle was at where Pastor Eli was. And um, it kind of, I mean, there's a lot, I think, in our marriage uh, that's happened since then. There's massive testimonies of how we even got together. Uh, God, God really let me see Kyle's heart before um, I was ever physically attracted to him. So yeah. I, my testimony is I never thought he was attractive. Uh, I didn't, though. I, I remember looking at him, and I'm like, really, God? That's, <laughs> that's what you got for me, but okay. 
No. <laughs> doesn't hurt my feelings. No, it doesn't. I look in the mirror every day, and I'm like, look at that guy right there. <laughs> Uh, well, I look at him the same now, too, and I'm like, oh, look <laughs> at that kidding. guy right there. So, um, no, God really was able to let me see his heart um, before I was able to see the physical attraction that I do now have for him, okay? Hallelujah. Don't worry. <laughs> and uh, We have and, four kids, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so, I mean, to kind of wrap that up, I mean, Kyle and I really, our marriage, like, we, we had a really really hard first year marriage. And my biggest testimony coming from that is I really believe God put us on a fast track uh, to marriage uh, and being able to work through some of these. And ultimately, Kyle and I both have a heart to do what God calls us to do. And so no matter whether we're fighting, arguing, or whatever's going on, whether it's kids, I mean, we were married with a kid. So we had to learn how to be parents, how to do finances, how to live in a home, and do all of that right at the yeah. same time. And it is not easy, right? Yeah. Uh, some of y'all can probably relate. And some of you guys are like, man, I had it in stages and it was still hard. <laughs> so <laughs> it's hard. Mm -hmm. And we, we had to get it together really quickly. And God really worked in us to be able to get it together and have um, tools in our back pocket. And I'm not just talking about the word. Obviously, that's our number one tool. But he really gave us people in our lives, and we went to counseling, and we have um, amazing, amazing mentors in our life. And he has continued to give that to us, and especially Kyle, uh, of mentors that we can really fall on and saying, hey, we're, we're really struggling with this, and we just need you right now. And uh, God put us on the fast track, and um, you want to take over from there? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. That? Yeah. So that's, that's the gist of our story. I mean... Most of you who saw all of the transition videos, you know, we were living in Vero Beach and, and how God spoke to us while we were in Israel that we were supposed to come here and, and pastor this church and, uh, and all of the supernatural dots that God connected for us to get here. Um, but last week, I was sitting over here just praying and the Lord spoke to me and said that we were supposed to tell our testimony this morning. And I, I think that there's a lot of reasons for that. Number one, I've been here since June, and you guys have learned a lot about my, my preaching style. Some of you have learned a lot about my leadership style, but we want you to know that we are open books. We are people just like you. We're people just like you, and we want you to know um, that we're approachable and that we want to be in your lives and that we can relate to whatever you're going through. That we, we weren't just these, uh, you know, these people who were raised in a perfect home and everything was handed to us and, and I just, you know, went to Bible college and never had any hard times and we never had any fights in our marriage or, come on. There's no such thing as a pastor that doesn't have real things that they go through and that they've been through. And so we want to create an environment of transparency at the church. We don't want to be a church where people have to put their mask on to come in. We want this to be a place where you can tell people who you are and no one's going to look at you sideways. And you can know that the senior pastor of the church has a past just like anybody else, but I'm not defined by my past. I'm defined by my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so if the worship team would like to come up, I think it's a good time to close. Do you have anything else, honey? I'm sorry. You want me to rap? I'll think about it. Pastor Marvin is taking over that mantle with his uh, spoken word poetries. Amen. Hallelujah. I think we should just sit here until he does. No, 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 no. <laughs> the Lord wants us to worship. <laughs> if you want to stand with me, I, I'm bad at being put on the spot, but I appreciate that. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about it. What is the theme of today Jesus his ear is not too heavy to hear nor is his arm too short to save you see if you're in this place or if you're tuning in online and you're far from God right now and the story that we just shared you say I need that God will meet you right where you're at I want you to say the same thing that I said God I want to follow you but I need you to show me how 
But if you're here in this place right now, you say, I've been walking with the Lord, but I need intimacy, intimacy with Him to be restored. That's what this message is about today. It's to let you know that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all that you can ask for or imagine according to the power that's at work within us. You see, it wasn't me that made anything happen. It was me saying, God, I can't do it anymore. God, I can't handle this anymore. God, if I keep going in the direction I'm going, there's going to be nothing but death and destruction. Save me, Jesus. And I tell you, in the year 2021, Jesus is still the Savior of the world, and His arm is not too short for Him to save anybody. There's no one who's too far gone for God to save. And the city of Flint is a mission field like none other. There are Amandas and Kyles all over this town, and we need to be able to believe God that if He can save us, He can save them. He wants us to walk in the joy of our salvation. He wants us to return to our first love. And he's telling you to tell your story to somebody else, amen. He wants us to be a, a church that prioritizes the souls of humankind because we know that they were created in the image of God. You see, if you would have met me when I was a drug dealer, you probably would have thought God can't use him. Some of you would have. He's too far gone. But let me ask you this. If you would have uh, met the Apostle Paul when he was persecuting Christians, you might have said the same thing. But God can interrupt and he can transform and he can raise up the most unlikely person to declare the majesty of his great name throughout all of the earth. We're going to see God do it in Genesee County, but he's not going to be limited to Genesee County. We're going to see God move from this church all over the world, I, I believe it. Because we're going to overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb. The same blood that washed me clean, the same blood that washed Pastor Amanda clean can wash you clean today. And by the word of our testimony, that is, I can testify that Jesus really does save. And if he saved me, he can save you. Amen. Will you bow your heads with me? With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this place and you say, I need to follow Jesus, but I don't know how, I want you to lift your hand real quick. Say, I need to follow Jesus, but I just don't know how. I want you to pray this with me and mean it in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, save me. Rescue me from myself. Make me new. I want to follow you. I need you to show me how. Give me the power to do it, God. Give me the confidence to do it, God. Give me the boldness to do it, God. I surrender to you right now, Lord Jesus. If you're online, I want you to pray that with me as well. I surrender all, everything to you right now. I want to be yours forever. And if you're in this place and you say, I need a fresh touch from God. I want to invite our altar workers to come forward as we get ready to pray. Those of you who are praying for our folks at the altar, if you'll come down right now. We want God to move in this place today. So I want to pray for you as we get ready to worship. Father, I pray for every heart in this room. I know that you have created us as fearfully and wonderfully made. You have ordained purpose for your people. There's not one soul in this place that God does not love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I pray that you'll fill our hearts with a, with a fresh love, a fresh love a fresh knowledge of your love for us today. And as we worship you, Lord, I pray that you would empower us for the work of soul winning in the county of Genesee, in the city of Flint. So Father, we worship you. We give you praise. I pray for a new, a new wind. God, I pray for a new wind in this place. I pray, God, for a new outpouring of your life in this place. I pray, God, for a new... Uh, uh, covering of your blood over each and every heart. I plead the blood of Jesus over every heart and life. I declare healing in this place right now. I declare victory in this place right now. We declare that this will be a place that God has total control. So Father, do what you know how to do. Set us free, God, and make us walk in the fullness of who you are 
as we worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship him. He's worthy.